Hi everybody, and thanks for viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial. Instead of tying one specific pattern for you today, I'm instead going to go into the thoughts behind a fly's variations. What I mean by that is that you take an original pattern, modify the fly tying material slightly, and then you have a variation of that pattern. As of this recording, I have approximately 100 fly tying tutorials on YouTube, and a large portion of those are of variations. As a tire of approximately 25 years, the notion of a variation really just comes second nature to me. However, I can 100% promise you that as a beginner, the majority of my variations were purely accidental and rarely, if ever, intentional. The most interesting part of that, however, and I'm hoping you can connect with this, is the fact that I happened to catch some fish on some of those accidental variations. And I soon learned from trial and error that many of them worked and were effective. That's the really beautiful part about this craft. The notion that it's very open-ended and I really encourage all of you to channel that inner creativity when varying and modifying flies of your own. For this video I'm going to talk about a Prince Nymph. I'm going to tie it on a jig style hook and I'm going to show you basically a smorgasbord of all the variations that I can think of or at least as many as I have time for. We're talking about the bead, the weight, the tail, the ribbing, the body material, the leg fibers, and finally the horns. And I haven't even talked about the hot spot yet if you want to vary the color of the thread. So with all that said, I'm going to kind of get everything set up. I have four different hooks that I'm going to start with, with four different bead heads on them, and I'm going to go forward from there. Okay, first let me take you through uh, my thinking as I'm talking about the hook and the weight on the hook. For starters, I have a jig style hook. We know that because it's a down eye, but it's also turned, it's more at a 45 degree angle. Because of this style eye for this jig style hook, it's going to be riding with the hook point up in the water column. That's really a big key because that tells me that we can weight this hook and not worry about it getting snagged on the bottom. This is a size 10 hook. For a size 10, I'm going to have a bead head with a lot of weight. We're talking 0.015 to 0.020 weight on there, really to weigh this, this um, fly down in the water column. I would use a size 10 as more of an anchor fly. Now I'm going to show you a size 16 of that same model. Again, this is the jig style. For this size 16, it's significantly smaller, as you can tell. Because it's a jig style hook, I'm still going to be fishing this with a bead head. I will have a little bit of weight, something along the lines of 0 .010. And then finally, the four that I'm going to be tying for you today are going to all be on size 14 hooks. I already have lead wire on them, and I'll explain to you why. For starters, this would kind of be like what I would call the standard. We have a size 14 hook. It's got a, a gold or a brass tungsten bead head and it's got 0 .010 lead wire. I would fish this pattern more as the dropper fly, but I wouldn't be afraid to use it higher up. And I, by higher up on my, my line, I basically mean it would be the first fly off the tippet. It wouldn't necessarily be an anchor because as a size 14, I really don't define an anchor as that, that small of a pattern. However, it's something that I could feel comfortable fishing as the first or the second fly in a two fly system. The next one I'm gonna show you is really one of my favorite Prince variations, and that's as more of a stone fly. Again, size 14, but this time I have a black, it's a dark tungsten head. Still the lead wire, about eight turns of .010 lead wire. I'll show you that one more time because I have the same lead wire on all four of these ones. Next, we're gonna have one with a real a hot spot. For this hot spot, we're talking about the bead. We have a fluorescent orange bead, and we have, again, that 0 .010 lead wire. By putting this bead up front like that, it really is just going to shout as almost a beacon to the fish. What I would really prefer to, to do with this pattern, I would fish this as a lead fly in a two-fly rig. Then off the bend, I'll have some tippet approximately 5x, maybe 4x, depending on the water that I'm fishing, with another pattern, more of a muted pattern. Thus, whenever this fly is coming through the water, I really believe this hot spot might get the fish's attention 
and it will grab that second fly on my rig. Finally, I have one that already has both lead and some thread on it. This has a, a disco uh, slotted tungsten bead on the front. I like those disco beads because they really just seem to reflect a lot of light off them. But for this one, you can, you'll, you'll see that I already have some lead wire and it's already wrapped. But if you notice with, the, with this um, lead wire that I've placed on there, it's been flattened too. What I did was I put eight turns of the .010 lead wire, just like I had done with the previous three. Then I cut two strands of this lead wire and I placed a strand on each side of that uh, circular lead wire that I'd already wrapped. After I have one placed on each side, I locked it in place with thread. And I just took a pair of, geez, these pliers, they're flat pliers, and I just put it over it, and I just flattened everything. And the reason I did that is simple. I am always saying, please check out those insects in your local and home waters and find out what they look like. Well, a lot of the smaller mayflies in my local waters have very flat thoraxes. And that's a great way to keep your fly on the bottom with that lead wire, but also to represent that mayfly with a flattened thorax. So this pattern is going to be a little bit different than those other three. It's still going to be a prince nymph. It'll be a darker pattern. However, it's going to be attempting to represent some of the mayflies in my local waters versus those other ones, which could be more around either a caddis or an attractor type nymph. Now that I've shown you um, the, the hooks and my rationales behind the weights, I'm going to start placing on their tails and go over my thoughts in regards to each of those. All right, next, let's focus on the tail for this Prince Nymph. The base is typically two brown goose biots. They're separated and splaying apart from one another. That's what I placed on this hook. This is the one with the hot spot for the tungsten. A nice variation is changing the color. So on our base hook, and by base I mean that gold bead head, I have a set of olive goose biots. If you remember, the hook that I mentioned that has the disco bead, I had created the flattened thorax, and that's the one that's going to mimic a mayfly. Because of that, I varied the, the tail, and instead of placing goose biots for the tailing fibers, I place Coque de Leon fibers. You'll notice that the Coque de Leon fibers are actually a little bit longer than those goose biots. For the length of the goose biots, I like them to be just a little shorter than the length of the hook shank, whereas for a mayfly tail, I wanted approximately the same length sometimes a millimeter longer. And then finally, for my Prince Nymph that I have with a dark colored bead, this is going to represent a stonefly. So I want to take you through the process. I'm just going to be using some 6 aught black thread. This is thread by Yuna. Sorry, it was caught in a, uh, a feather over there. Place this thread on. I'm just going to go to the very back of the lead wire. Build a transition point. Lock all of my wire in place. Bring my thread to approximately where the barb of the hook would be. I might grab some black goose biots. I want to find some lengthier ones that are pretty wide, so I'm going to go to the middle to the bottom of this goose feather. I'm going to trim two. I'm going to separate them because I want them splayed apart. I'll tie them in one at a time after measuring them against the, the hook shank. Again, I want them to be the same length or a little bit shorter. After I have them measured, I'm just going to lock one in place, determine if it's in the correct location. Once it is, I'll just place a few more wraps. I'll grab the second one, line it up against the first. And do the same with it. I'm going to clip the butt ends. And then it's on to the next step, which is our ribbing. Okay, please disregard the fact that we have some finished bodies on a few of these flies, and instead let's focus on the ribbing. On this fly in front of you, this is what I would consider to be a base style ribbing. 
The material is by Uni Products. It's French oval copper tinsel. The size is medium. I really like the, the Uni Product because it seems to be extremely resilient on these flies, especially on these Prince nymphs. But please don't overthink the ribbing. For example, on the dark prints that I'm tying right now, I don't know if that's the name of a movie, instead of putting on some type of a tinsel, instead I've gone with some ultra wire. Size brassy, the color's black. I really like the fact that it gives me a little bit of extra weight and I recommend attempting some other uh, materials like that. In fact, you can go with the, the Uni soft wire. This is size small in red. It, it will give you a really nice contrasting color. If you're fishing this pattern um, with less weight, you're just afraid that by adding some of those wires, it might you know, do a little bit too much, but you still want to get some type of flash on it, don't be afraid to go with something like crystal flash. You're not really adding any weight whatsoever, but you're still going to be accomplishing that flashy look for the ribbing that we can accomplish with, with some other materials that may add a little bit more weight. So don't be afraid to experiment. I know a lot of tires that will simply use a thread body because they don't really want that, that ribbing to be prominent. Another ribbing material that I've used over the years is going to be this French varnished tinsel by La Garton in sil silver. It's a little bit of a smaller tinsel, but it still gives that nice ribbing and, and really shows that segmentation, especially when wet. I'm trying to basically show you a little bit of each fly along in the process. This is my fly that I had the, the olive goose biots. I'm going to show you how I would add in the ribbing. And in this case, because I'm going with those olive biots, I'm also going to pair it with some ultra wire brassy color olive. I'm going to snip a healthy piece away. Whenever I tie the ribbing in place, I'm going to, I'm going to basically put it directly behind where my lead wire had ended. I'll start it there, then wrap back until I get to that tail position. And at that point, it's time to tie in my body. Now for the bodies, I really prefer good old peacock curl. I really wish I had some kind of a great deal with some company and I was able to get the best peacock curl on the market, but I don't and I can't. So instead, um, I'll really show you how I go about the process of selecting the hurl. For starters, once I pick up a bag of this, and I'll just zoom out a little bit so you can see this, I'm really looking for that green color to be just very prominent. I typically will not buy this product sight unseen. So if you can look at just the bag right now from the camera angle, you'll see a lot of green in there. And that's what I'm going for. That does not mean I'll just pull out every uh, single piece of hurl and use that on this fly. I'll typically just pull this material out by the tips about three or four at a time. Of course, it's not, I'm not doing that right now. And as I remove these pieces, I'm looking for those that have a lot of those little fibers coming off. And I'll just try to show you my thinking throughout this process by showing you the actual fibers. In this case, this has some, some nice fibers on it. It's a very consistent pattern, but they're very small. By small, I'll show you one that has larger fibers that I would prefer. Here's one that I also grabbed out of that same packet. And you can see the one closer to the hook has larger fibers with, with more of that coloration. So I would prefer this one. This is one fiber. I'm going to get three of these and I'm going to use the three together. I found a second one. Let me see if I can find one more with lots of coloration like those ones. I don't see any on the ones that I pulled out so I'm just going to grab a few more from this bag and I found one more. So all three of these really have a lot of nice fibers on them. I'll show them to you right here. Before tying them in, I line them up by the tip. If you're unsure which section is the tip, the bottom section normally has this, this whitish stuff on them. That would be the butt end. I want to tie them in by the tip. So I first line them all up together and I trim them so that they're all even. 
At that point, I'll lock them in place, bring my thread forward, and then I can start winding. I'm going to wind all three at the same time in one direction. I want to make sure each wrap is touching the previous one, and I'm going to bring these the whole way up to that bead. Once I get them locked into place, I'm going to trim, get rid of those butt ends, and I'm next going to bring forward my wire ribbing. I'm going to wrap it in the opposite direction to trap those peacock fibers in place. I want to make sure my spacing is the same the whole way up, and on a size 14 hook, I'll get approximately three turns with a very wide tinsel, four turns with a wire such as the one that I just wrapped forward. I'm going to break this off. And then that's my finished look, not of the fly, but just of the body and of the ribbing. Let me lock this in place with just a quick whip finish. Now if you examine the ribbing on this one, it's going to be very tough for you to see on camera. That green is going to be a muted color, but whenever it's wet, it will become more prominent, especially to the fish. I'll go back and I'll show you the other ones now. This again was the silver tinsel, and that was with a peacock curl body. Notice that ribbing is all evenly spaced. This was with the black wire. Very tough to see, very muted. Maybe if I get in a certain light for you, you might be able to pick up the ribbing. And again, that's with a peacock curl body. And then finally, the first fly that I originally showed you on whenever I was talking about ribbing did not have a peacock curl body. I did have a, a Una French oval uh, tinsel ribbing. However, for the body in this case, I went with a peacock dubbing. That's an another nice variation. This is uh, Simon dubbing, the color's Peacock Bronze. I got this from Kevin Compton over at Performance Flies, and it's still gonna give you a lot of those great qualities that Peacock Hurl will give you. However, you don't have to worry about that hurl tearing whatsoever in the water. You can also pick this out with Velcro and make it a little more buggy if you prefer that buggier look on some of your patterns. So I've just showed you a ton of variations there. When you're, you're thinking ribbing, don't be afraid to try what you have. Think of it as either something that will add weight or it's going to increase the versatility of the peacock curl. For the body of the Prince Nymph, you want to go with a really solid material. You want to go with one that you're going to trust, which is typically that standard one, peacock curl. When you're selecting curl, pick out and select the best fibers that you can. If you don't feel comfortable with that peacock curl, you can go with a peacock dubbing and instead simply dub it on. All right, we have a couple final pieces. We're going to get into the horns and the legs on this Prince Nymph, and then we'll finish the flies, and I'll show you a little bit more about hot spots near the bead. For the legs of the standard Prince Nymph, the recommendation or the base will call for a hen hackle. Hen hackles are great because they're a little webby. They undulate in the water. For this stone fly that I'm tying, for this black Prince Nymph, I'm going to be using a darker hen hackle. Another material that I really love to use is CDC. I'll be showing you one here with Hungarian partridge. And finally, I also really enjoy making dubbing loops and placing some synthetic materials inside that loop and then creating the legs that way. To prepare a hen hackle, I have the hackle facing me. I'm going to strip off the left side of the hackle as close to the tip as possible and I'm also going to strip off all the buggy looking marabou down the stem on both sides. Once I have all those materials removed this is what they look like. I'm next going to pinch the tips and stroke the fibers in the opposite direction creating a tie-in point.
After I have all those locked in place, I'm gonna grab my hackle pliers. These are my hackle pliers from Stonfo. Just pinch, pinch the, the butt end of that hen hackle, and I make approximately two wraps. And that is the hen hackle for this Prince Nymph. Because I'm at this point in this fly, I'm going to just tie in the horns as well. For the horns, they call for goose biots again. I'll be varying them just a little bit and I'll be tying them in black on this pattern. This is that darker pattern and I really prefer to keep everything dark on this one to represent those stone flies. After I've trimmed away two of them, I want them to go straight down the sides of the body. Now on a typical Prince Nymph, they would go on the top, but we have to remember this is gonna be riding hook point up because of this jig style hook. I took a fly tying class with George Daniel and he recommends tying them directly along the sides because the fish will still be able to see them and you'll still get that traditional Prince Nymph look. So I'm gonna tie one in on this side first. And these are both tied with the, with the bend of that fiber facing towards the body. Okay, after I remove the butt ends, I'm gonna go immediately to a whip finish. Prior to doing that, I'm gonna add a little bit of Sally Hansen. This is hard as nails, the advanced. I'm gonna place some of that directly on the thread. So I know that my thread base is very secure. And after my whip finish, we have a finished Prince Nymph with a slight variation to this pattern. The purpose of this video is the variation. Let me go back and show you the original pattern in a sense with that hot spot for the bead. On this original pattern, you'll notice there are no legs. If I'm gonna be fishing this in faster water, I don't believe those legs are something that's essential to this pattern. I don't believe those fish are really looking for those legs whenever they see this fly come rocketing through a riffle. Now, if you're fishing a slower pull, a slower riffle, that might be something those fish key on. Thus, I will tie legs on those patterns. Whenever we're talking about these horns, that's something I really like to vary as well. The traditional is the brown tail, white at the front. In this case, for these biots, I'm going with chartreuse. I like that chartreuse color. It almost makes it look like a little hot spot in a sense. It's definitely different. It's probably not gonna represent anything in the water, but it could be something different that the fish may be attracted to. The other way I look at this is that I'll tie a fly off the bend of this hook, a smaller muted pattern. By having those chartreuse horns on this fly, it may just capture the fish's attention and then that fish might kind of lean towards that second fly coming towards it. And then finally, I really love soft tackles. This was the mayfly pattern that I was tying with that Prince Nymph. So this is kind of a Prince Nymph variation, and I'm gonna call this one the soft tackle Prince Nymph. Now there's not a lot of similar, there's not a lot of the same characteristics anymore. In fact, I bet some people would probably argue with me and say, this is no longer a Prince Nymph because I've changed the tail from a goose biot to Coq de Leon. I don't have peacock hurl for the body, I have peacock dubbing, and I don't have horns. I've removed the horns altogether, and instead I went with a darker Hungarian partridge fiber 
to represent those emerging legs. This could also represent a drowned mayfly. I really love soft hackles and I love how those fibers will be undulating, very similar to some of the hen hackle that we use in other patterns. So these are some finished variations that I wanted to share with you. The final piece that I would like all of you to keep in mind is that whenever you finish your pattern, say you really want just something else on it. You're just saying, gosh, this is a really dark pattern. I really want something else for those fish to gravitate to. Don't be afraid to add a hot spot in at the front. A very easy way to do that is to grab some UV thread and just make a few wraps dire directly behind the bead and trim off. Now the key is that you want this, this thread to be fluorescent. The easiest way for me to tell is with the, these lights off, I take my UV light and I shine it against those threads. The ones that are, that are fluorescent, you can see really take off. It may be tough in this video, but from my perspective, they really shine. This is one made by Glowbright. The color is, I believe, number one, it's a pink. Here's one made by Raymond Rumpf and Son. It's more of an orange, and it really goes fluorescent. Here's one by Uni. This is their Uni Floss. It's hot pink. Same thing, it really gets fluorescent whenever I hit it with the UV light. And Uni also makes a Uni thread in chartreuse. Same thing, really just takes on that nice fluorescent color. So those are a few more variations that I'm gonna throw out there to you. There's lots of variations for this standard Prince Nymph, and I really encourage you to try some out, see how they fish on your home waters, and then start making those same modifications and same variations towards some other patterns. I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into towards my own thinking in regards to variations of flies, and this was just one. So I know as I tie flies on a regular basis, I'm always trying to think of those variations that can make them more effective and help me catch more fish. Well, with all that said, I really appreciate you viewing this YouTube fly tying tutorial. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them directly on this YouTube page, or you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for watching this video on fly tying variations.